Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heartway Church at Home. We're so excited that you decided to join us. Just a quick announcement for you. We're trying to do one last big push for our Feeding the Hungry uh, food drive for Thanksgiving. Our goal is to feed 50 families. We have so far enough to feed eight. So it's $60 per family. You can give at heartratechurch.com forward slash give. Make sure you select on the drop down menu to feed a family. And we really want to try to hit that goal. So we just encourage all those who are able to, to go ahead and give whatever you can so that we can go ahead on Wednesday and feed as many families as possible and truly bless them with a wonderful meal for Thanksgiving. And we just thank you all for your generosity. Right now, you're going to witness a incredible uh, message from Danny. And before that, Chris is going to lead us in our centering prayer. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mic check. Hey. How's it going, fam? How's it going, fam? Oh, okay. I just, I didn't know if you guys were there. <laughs> um, How was everyone's week? Ooh, a little full moon, a little lunar eclipse. You know, I'm like the astrology girl, so I just come up here and talk about weird things. <laughs> um, so, on my way here, I was debating on like what I was going to talk about. And um, can I ask something? Can you guys just trust me with this one? Okay. Oh, I have to set my timer because I always get yelled out. Crystal, you only have 10 minutes. <laughs> but I'm going to set it to 11-11, and then we're going to make a wish at the end. All right? <laughs> All right, let's do this. Shall we? So we close our eyes, and we come home to ourselves in this beautiful moment. And we take a deep inhale through the nose. And we exhale through the mouth. And we let it all go. We let the week go. We let it all go as we inhale through the nose. And we exhale through the mouth. Let it out, let it go. Audible exhale through the mouth. If you feel like you need some grounding, I ask that you face your palms downward. Maybe you need guidance. Face your palms upward. And we breathe into our center. We breathe into exactly who we are in this moment. And we repeat the mantra, I am exactly where I need to be in life. And we deep inhale, in through the nose, out through the mouth, let it go. And as we follow this breath, we come home to ourselves in this moment. Come home to your beautiful heart. And now I want you to bring to your mind's eye something that you have been praying for. That love, that relationship, that job, that financial abundance, something that you have been really praying for. Maybe it is healing for you, a family member, a loved one, this earth, something that has been weighing on you that you have been praying to God for. And just trust. So bring it to your mind's eye. And we're going to manifest this for you today. 
we're going to use the power of your thought to manifest this and bring this into physical reality. And so we breathe into this vision, into this picture, into this desire, and we exhale. And as we breathe in, we exhale resistance and we open our hearts to love and we open our hearts to God's work. So when we build up that resistance, our manifestations cannot come to fruition. So we have to make space within to allow God to do the work. And so we breathe into this vision. And as we breathe into it, I want you to incorporate your senses. So feel yourself already having this vision. So for example, if it is love, feel yourself being hugged by the person that you crave, that you desire. If it is abundance and wealth, feel what it feels like to have this abundance and this wealth in your palms. If it is an answer, Feel the emotions that you feel once you receive the answer that you seek oh so badly. And we breathe into this vision. And we release resistance. your manifestation what does it feel like what does it smell like the trick with the law of attraction is you have to act as if you already have the desire it is already here So take this desire and as we breathe in, we breathe in light and we fill this desire with light, the light of God and feel it in your body. Fill your mind with this desire. If it brings you happiness, feel the happiness right here and right now from the desire. If it brings you a relief in tears, feel the tears, feel the relief. Let go of the resistance because it is already yours. And we breathe. Sometimes we run into situations especially within our childhood where maybe we feel that we're undeserving of wealth of abundance of peace maybe we were told that we don't deserve happiness we don't deserve joy Maybe we were told we weren't good enough. Breathe into that resistance if this is true for you. And as you hold on to this manifestation, I want you to pretend that you are walking on the beach. 
Feel the sand within your toes. Feel the wind on your skin. Feel the sun on your back. And as you continue to walk, you look forward and you see someone that looks so familiar. And as you get closer and closer, it is your inner child. It is the young version of you who has dealt with so much. And this version of you is here to tell you that it is okay to forgive and let go of resistance and open your heart to God's light and love because he has so much waiting for you that you are deserving, that you are love, that you are a part of this infinite creation, this infinite intelligence. And as you walk closer to your inner child, I want you to get on one knee and face your inner child. Open your arms. Embrace this little girl, embrace this little boy. Repeat the words, I love you so much. And I thank you for everything that you have overcome in this lifetime at such a young age. And the adult version of me is here to take care of everything else, to open our hearts to receive the blessings and the love of, and the love of light of God. Does your inner child have a message for you today? Take a second to be here. You are safe now. Tell your inner child, I am safe. And I love you. And I forgive you. And I forgive all versions of me. I am abundant and I am worthy of receiving all the manifestations and desires that my heart craves ever so badly. Oh shoot, it's 11-11. <laughs> so we release our embrace with our inner child and we let go. And as we come home to our manifestation that was in our mind's eye, we now know that it is safe to receive this abundance. We breathe into this and we expect it to come to fruition. And so it is. And as you come home to your body, awaken your mind, heart, body, soul to the infinite intelligence that you are, that is connected to every and anything. We send light to the world right now. And when you're ready, you may open your eyes. I love you. Oh wait, 1111, let's make a wish. Ready? Namaste.
Namaste. Thank you. <laughs>Good morning, everybody. Happy rainy Sunday. I'm happy that you made it because it was kind of hard to get out of bed, at least for me. Jeez. So I want to just take a few moments this morning and talk to you about being a safe space. I want to talk about what that means and what that looks like in relation to the way that we connect with other individuals in our life. I was uh, speaking to a pastor friend of mine years ago, and he was telling me about a moment of crisis in his life. He was sharing with me that his brother-in-law was in the military, and several years ago, he died as a result of an explosion in Iraq. And when this happened, it rocked his world completely. His faith shattered he did not know what direction to turn. And to make matters worse, all of the people that were in his life during this time, because he was a pastor, because he was in religious environments so often, he would receive words of quote unquote comfort and advice that actually made things worse. Anybody ever experienced that? Like someone, they're trying to help you <laughs> and they have good intentions, but the things that they're saying are like negating the way that you feel or like, why do you feel like that? You shouldn't feel like that because this, this, that or the other. <laughs> and how irritating is that when you're on the back end of it, especially when this advice and these words of comfort and encouragement are super spiritual and religious, maybe overly spiritualized <laughs> in a certain type of way. For my friend, he felt like he couldn't be real and honest and genuine with his emotions around certain people because anytime that he would say something, they would just kind of shut it off with their Bible verses or whatnot. It's very difficult to be yourself when you're in that kind of a setting. And he drifted for years from his faith practice because of uh, what he felt was people not actually seeing and honoring his pain, trying to sweep it under the rug with their religiosity. And it was almost as if they were trying to get him to move past this at a pace that he was just not ready for. Interestingly enough, uh, this week, I was hanging out with a rabbi. Uh, I shared with some of you that I got a new job as a chaplain at a hospice. So basically, a chaplains offer spiritual support and pastoral care uh, outside of like a congregational setting. And my setting now is hospice, end-of-life care for people who are uh, transitioning. And part of the prep work for this involves uh, me shadowing other chaplains that are doing this work. And this week, I got to spend some time with Rabbi Stephen, 72-year-old man. We had a lot in common, super cool dude. And he somehow, our conversation got here, but he was teaching me and telling me about some of the customs and the rituals that Jewish people engage in uh, when certain people die within their community. And he was telling me that they are very intentional about what they do and what they don't do when people are grieving. So for example, the time between the moment someone dies and the moment that they're buried, for these folks is all about giving them space. The gift that they give to one another when someone is experiencing grief to this magnitude is the gift of solitude. We're, we're gonna give them some distance. So if you're not in like that super close inner circle, if you're not a part of those who are like deeply, deeply impacted by the loss, if you're like on the periphery, that's not the time that you step into these people's lives with any sort of words or 
any sort of advice or encouragement. No, during that time, you kind of leave them alone. You give them the gift of space. And as I was hearing this, the thought that came to me was, man, this is genius. It's so simple, (laughs) but we don't do it. Like sometimes the most difficult thing for us to do is to give space to the people that are closest to us. Like for myself, there was a time when if, whether it was my spouse or a partner or a friend that was really close to me, if we had some sort of a conflict, I was so uncomfortable with conflict that we had to resolve the issue now. Now, anybody else kind of like that? It's like, no, 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 if we have a problem, we're fixing this right now. I'm not gonna wait. We're gonna talk about it right now. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? It's so hard to just give people a little bit of space. Not everybody is gonna process things at the same rate, at the same pace that you do. But we love to insert ourselves into people's issues and problems and conflicts with all of our incredible solutions. That, that, that's just what we love to do. We, we force people to process things the way that we do. We, we think that people should handle themselves in situations in the same manner that we do, and we do all that we can to try and wake them up to the fact that they're doing it wrong. And instead of honoring where these people are, We try and force them to where we think they should be. But just because something works for you doesn't mean it's going to work for them. And even if you are an expert on all matters concerning you, which, by the way, is highly questionable. (laughs) But even if you were an expert on all matters concerning you, that does not make you an expert on others. That does not make you an expert on others. There is no rule book for how to process difficult emotions. There is no rule book for how to heal from trauma or how to handle conflict. Everybody processes things in their own unique way. And if we try and force people to act or respond in a way that is not natural to them, we can end up doing a lot more damage than good. Sometimes we just got to give people a little bit of distance and a little bit of space. Feeling anger, grief, sadness, anxiety, depression is totally normal. And it's okay sometimes if people want to be alone, if they don't want to talk about it right now. Can we leave room for people to handle things in the way that they handle things without trying to bring them into a way of doing this that is more akin to how we would. So what does it look like to give the people closest to us the gift of distance, the gift of space, whenever that gift is needed? Allow yourself and allow others to feel whatever they need to feel without rushing them through that. There's no need to try and hide or... or, um, sweep under the rug the way that we feel. In fact, one of the most harmful things that you can do is to act like there is no pain when there really is. It's one of the most harmful things that you can do. At some point, if you want to heal, if you want reconciliation, you're going to have to explore your pain and enter into your pain. Otherwise, your past is going to continue to show up in your present. You'll, You'll be projecting it there. You know what I mean? Because if you haven't resolved that stuff from your past, guess, guess what? What you experience now will always be tainted by what you experienced then. So you got to face your stuff at some point. There's no need to, to hide or to pretend like everything's okay when it's not. But we got to give people room to do that and to express themselves and to share what they need to share and to be honest and vulnerable and transparent when they're ready on their timetable, not on ours. So this is why Jesus said, I did not come for the righteous, but for the sinner. Those who are healthy don't need a doctor, but those who are sick. So healing is possible, but you can't heal from the pain if you don't acknowledge that it's there. 
You got to be willing to acknowledge that you're sick. There's no need to try and um, act stronger than you really are. In fact, true strength is about having the courage to be weak. Having the courage to be honest, having the courage to be vulnerable. And true love is about allowing people to feel what they feel without negating or dismissing those feelings. As I was talking with Rabbi Stephen, he proceeded to tell me about something called sitting Shiva. Anybody ever heard of this? So what that means is after the burial happens, when someone passes away, the people who are closest to the immediate family, they will spend, it's typically seven days, but now sometimes they do it shorter amount of time, maybe three days, three to seven days of just sitting with these people in the home of the deceased person. And that's it. Like that's all they do. They just sit with them. There are no words spoken no answers that are given, no verses that are quoted, no prayers that are prayed during this time, just presence and solidarity. And that's their way of saying to these people who have just, just lost someone that they love, I love you so much that I'm not going to sweep this under the rug or pretend like it didn't happen or act like everything's fine when it isn't. I love you so much that I'm going to be in it with you. And that's what a lot of us don't realize. When people are suffering, your presence can do so much more than your words could ever do. Your presence with them can do so much more than your words could ever do. People don't need your answers. They need your love. In the Hebrew scriptures, there's a story of a man named Job. Job had it all. He had a beautiful family. He had wealth. He had a wonderful relationship with his maker. One thing turns to another and he loses it all. He loses it all. And he starts going through a faith crisis himself. He doesn't know why this is happening to him. He has a lot of questions. And Job in this story has a few friends that uh, come around him during this time, but they came around him with, with a whole lot of advice. They had all the answers as to why this was happening and what he needed to do to fix these problems so that he can get his life back. And Job gets so frustrated with these people at, at one point that look at what he says to them. He says, you are all worthless physicians. If only you could be silent. That's the wisest thing that you could do. Worthless physicians. I don't need your answers right now. I just need your love. Stop telling me what I should or shouldn't do. Stop trying to fix these problems. Stop trying to explain it away. Can you just listen? Can you just pay attention? Can you just be there? Can you show empathy? Can you have compassion? Why do we think that we have the answers? Especially for other people. Even if you do have an answer, if other people aren't ready to hear it, then it's no good. What good is your answer if someone else is not in a place to be able to hear it and receive it. And you can't force somebody to be ready to hear something that they cannot hear. Plus, you don't have all the answers. The answers that other people need are within them, not you. So you can facilitate and hold space for people to be able to go inward and discover that wisdom and those answers for themselves but you are not the answer man. You are not the answer woman. Here's another thing. You can be totally right, but if you don't have love, you're totally wrong. And that's what some of us have not awakened to yet. 
We are so much better at analyzing other people's lives than our own. So we have all this confidence when we see the problems that other people are going through and we know how to dissect it and we know the solution for them. We know exactly what to tell them so that all of this can get fixed and get better. But the way that we communicate it comes off so icky and yucky, like you're better than. We're so insensitive sometimes to the way that people feel that they can't hear it. They can't hear it. And even if you are right, because of the way that you're communicating it, you're wrong. So love is about allowing people to feel what they feel, not overstepping boundaries, not meddling in people's business. We've got to get out of this business of giving people unsolicited advice. If they didn't ask for it, why are you giving it to them? If they didn't ask you for it, why are you giving it to them? And I know you mean well. We all mean well. There's nothing wrong with helping other people. It's a good thing to help other people. But oftentimes, helping others is the camouflage that ego wears to assert its own sense of superiority. I know more than you. I've been there before. I've experienced that. Let me help you. No, no, no. If you genuinely want to help other people, help yourself. Because what I've come to notice is that the line between helping others and fixing them can get very blurry sometimes. And we don't know the difference. And we think we're helping them by fixing them, but we're not. We're making it worse. So the best thing that I can do for you is to work on me. And the best thing that you can do for me is to work on you. And if we all just focused on working on ourselves, our relationships would be better, our world would be a much healthier place, and life would unfold in such a beautiful manner because we're not trying to control and dictate one another's lives anymore. Help yourself. Help yourself. I was reading in this book, author was talking about the Golden Gate, the Golden Gate Bridge being like one of the number one uh, places where people commit suicide and take their own life. Crazy. And there's two sides to the Golden Gate Bridge. One side faces the city, and then the other side faces the Pacific Ocean. This author pointed out that the side that people jump from the most is the side that faces the city. And what she said was, this isn't really a coincidence. For me, what this speaks to is the fact that even in their final moments, people just want somebody to witness their pain. They just want somebody to notice. They just want somebody to acknowledge the hurt that is there. And that's the gift that we get to offer to one another, the gift of space, the gift of presence, the gift of our attention and our awareness. It's about being a safe space. To be a safe space for others simply means that you become so deeply rooted and grounded in love that you can contain within yourself any feeling and any emotion that another person brings to you without trying to fix them or change them in the process. And man, if the husbands and boyfriends in this room understood how to do that. <laughs> and fathers, absolutely. To be a safe space means you embody a non-judgmental presence. A non-judgmental presence. If people feel that when they open up to you and share with you, they're going to get criticized. If they feel that when they open up and share with you, they're going to be judged. They're not going to want to be vulnerable with you anymore. 
And if somebody can't be vulnerable with you and honest with you, what are they going to start doing? Hiding, pretending, because they can't be themselves around you. And the longer somebody has to pretend around you, the more time there is for resentment and bitterness to build up within them. And eventually that doesn't end good. Because if I have to be somebody that I'm not when I'm around certain people because I know that if I say this or I say that, they're going to have a comment to make about it. This is not a safe space. It's not a safe space. Which is why I love so much this idea of sitting Shiva. Because it shows us that in the Jewish tradition, they're not in a rush to get people past their grief. Why is it that so often we're in a rush to just bring resolution? We've got to bring resolution to the problem. No, just sit in it for a little while. There's no rush to get past the grief. We're not in a hurry to get over the feeling and the emotion. One slow day at a time, if it has to be like that. Feeling all of the feelings. Experiencing all of the emotions. And letting growth and transformation happen naturally. Naturally. If you try and stuff the feelings or suppress the feelings, they only will intensify. So... It's also important for us as individuals to learn how to be safe spaces for ourselves. Every feeling and emotion should have a right to live in you. Every feeling and emotion should have the right to live in you. We get so scared of certain feelings and emotions. We don't want to feel them. But then they end up running our lives. And we call it fate and destiny when it's really just unhealed trauma. And like I said earlier, your experience now continues to be tainted by what you experienced then. What you believe about life becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, my God. Nobody cares about me. You will find the proof. You will find the proof. People take advantage of me. I do so much for other people and nobody does anything for me. Nobody acknowledges me. You will find the proof. It'll be there. I'm alone. You'll find the proof. Whatever you believe about life will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh. Yeah. When we're going through things, it's so easy for us to uh, just go into this explanation mode, trying to find a reason, trying to find an explanation as to why all of this is happening. And because we have that anxiety of wanting to find explanations, that's what we give and provide to other people because we think that that's going to make them feel better. Oh, let me explain to you why. Yeah, there's uh, flies in here today. Sorry, dude. Good, man. Thanks. They had an event here last night with a bunch of food, and now there's flies everywhere, but we're all right. I'm going to finish very quickly. We look for these explanations. We try and give them, we try and give them explanations, but explanations are not very useful when you're going through difficult moments in your life. In the Buddhist tradition, they actually have this wonderful illustration. Imagine yourself walking in a forest. And next thing you know, you get shot with an arrow in your leg. As you're laying there on the ground looking at this arrow that just hit your leg, are you thinking to yourself, man, I wonder how fast that arrow was going. <laughs> Man, I wonder where the feathers on this arrow came from. Who shot the arrow? No. You're thinking, I need to get this arrow out of my leg. Now. <laughs> when you're suffering in life, metaphysical explanations pertaining to why are useless. What matters is that you get the arrow out. 
That's all that matters. What matters is how we practically respond to life suffering. Not explaining away life suffering. More information doesn't mean more peace. And we, in relationships, this happens too. Like, oh my God, is he cheating on me? Is she cheating on me? I'm going to find out. And then we find out a little bit of information and we want more. As if the more is going to help. What is more going to do? Like, okay, you're already pissed with what you know. If you know more, what? You know how they say ignorance is bliss? Ignorance is bliss. There are some things I don't care to find out. More information doesn't mean more peace. And it's the same when it comes to like the big questions about life and suffering. More information doesn't mean more peace. Okay, fine. I, I have solved the mysteries of God. And I understand how all of it works. And this is why there's evil in the world. And this is why suffering happens. Okay. Now what? Now what? You're still sad. You're still depressed. You're still miserable. You got to figure out how to handle and deal with this stuff practically. Which is why literally at Heartway, I don't talk to you about what to believe. If you haven't picked that up yet, I don't share with you doctrines to believe. We talk about the art of living because life is what counts. So here at Heartway, as we wrap up, I want you to know that this is a safe space for you. There's nothing that you have done or will do there's nothing that you say that can be a shock to us here in this community. I've heard and seen it all. And <sighs> there's very few things that will shock me and surprise me at this point. There was somebody a couple years ago got in trouble with the law. They used to come to Hartway. And the way they got in trouble with the law, it was out there. News articles, on the news. So I was getting called, did you see so-and-so on the news? Did you read this article about so-and-so? <gasps> All right. So that happened. I never thought I would see this person again because Embarrassment, you know, shame. Maybe like three, four months later after this incident happened that was out there, I see this person walk into Hartway. And I look at them, I give them the biggest hug. And I thought to myself, mission accomplished. If this person can do that and experience all of the shame that they've probably been experiencing and still drag their two feet into this facility, we're doing something right. We're doing something right. No judgment, no condemnation. That's the MO. And we get to practice with one another every time that we get together. So be a safe space for yourself. Allow yourself to have room for error. Allow yourself to feel what you feel. Be patient with yourself. If you're already like going through it, don't lay on top of that the burden of how I should be handling this right now. No. If you're handling it in the worst possible way, you're handling it in the worst possible way. But that's the only way you know how. If you could do it better, you would, but you're not, and that's okay. And maybe you need to go get some therapy or something, or come talk to me, or go pray, or just do something. I don't know, but it's okay. Don't put on top of yourself the burden of how you should be reacting and responding. Let yourself be. Let it be. 
And as you practice this with yourself, now you will be able to extend this same grace and this same kind of safe space to the other people in your life. The reason why it's so easy for me to be a safe space for others is because I don't judge myself anymore. So if I, I mean, when I tell you I went all the way with it because I had a lot of religious guilt and shame, it's embedded in the system, it's how it works. I'm free from that. So if I'm gonna really give myself the pass to be human, <laughs> all the way to find God even in my shadow and darkness. If I'm giving myself that pass, you better believe I'm going to give you the pass. How can I hold you accountable when I'm not even holding me accountable? It's like St. Augustine. He would call his sin happy faults. Felix culpa. I sinned. Happy faults. It's a happy fault. Why? Because this is just another means by which I connect ever more deeply to the love of God. And it's in those moments when I've done the worst of atrocities, when God's presence and love and grace is closest to me. And now I actually know that to be true, which is why Paul said, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And the religious people who heard him say this, they're like, bro, what are you saying? That we should continue to sin so that grace can abound all the more? Are you implying that we can just do whatever we want and it's okay because God is so gracious and kind? And he says, no, I'm not saying that stupid. No, <laughs> the thing about it is when you really let the love of God in, in the moment of your deepest guilt and shame, what you want and desire and do changes naturally. You, you actually don't want to continue doing those things anymore. That is the natural byproduct of opening your heart to the fullness of God's love and grace and forgiveness in your life. It's like, yeah, I could do it and nothing would separate me from the love of God, but why would I do that? Like, there's nothing for me there that's empty. It lacks its vanity, its futility. Love changes and transforms everything. So give it to yourself, especially when you feel you don't deserve it. Especially when you feel you don't deserve it. Give yourself more. I'm telling you, for me, it got to a point where I, it was like, it felt like this is too good to be true. This is too good to be true. You, yes, you, let it be so good that you question whether it's true. Because it is unconditional love, no judgment, total grace, never-ending flow of forgiveness. It's already yours. It's already yours. It's already yours. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for Heartway, which is a safe space for people to be able to come with all of their baggage and all of their stuff and be able to feel loved and welcomed and embraced and accepted as they are. As we continue to sit in and bask in the safety of your presence, may we be able to extend that safe space to all of the people that we encounter in our lives. Help us to become a non-judgmental presence that offers solidarity and compassion and love instead of answers. Explanations and answers, they don't do too much good. But God, our, our presence, our compassion, 
our attention, that's something that you can work with. And that's something that leaves a mark in people's lives. Help us to help others by our actions instead of just our answers. And may we be an extension of your love everywhere that we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to donate for Feed a Family. We'll see you Wednesday for the outreach and the Circles of Trust. And then we'll catch you uh, next Sunday. Happy Thanksgiving.